بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent another messenger of Allah, a prophet by the name of Ibrahim alayhi salam. The story of Salih and Hud and Hud is mentioned about 26 times in the Quran, 26 places. The story of Ibrahim alayhi salam is repeated in the Quran more than 70 in 79 times in over 23 surahs. Because the story of Ibrahim is extremely important, so full of wisdom and lessons for our Ummah, for the world, that Allah mentioned it that many times. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he was born in Babylonia, in Iraq today. And he spoke a language other than Arabic. Arabic, or the original language of Hebrew, possibly Aramaic, with a people who worshipped idols with zealous, zealously. Obviously, they were, they knew who God was. They they all worshipped. They all said Allah is one. Like today, even the Jews say God is one. The Christians say God is one. The Sikhs, who are a branch of Hinduism, they say God is one. Everybody, even the Hindus themselves, say there is an ultimate one. The problem is that they brought deities and gave them different characteristics and called them gods as part of gods. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, I am the one and only. How can you worship other deities other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone who misguide you and do not speak to you and do not respond to you and cannot benefit you and you use them in order to create corruption and havoc and you use them in order to create superiority, superiority over others and hierarchies over others and so we can see in history as a result of what idolatry did when we reach the story of Pharaoh. In the time of Ibrahim السلام, there was a king. His name was called an namrud Nimrod meaning in Arabic, the one full of pride. And he used the idols, idolatry as a means to create his, uh, himself as an ultimate uh, king of all kings to the point where he himself called himself a god. When people follow false, then everybody can make up any religion they want. There was uh, this man who uh, made up his own religion and he said there are aliens that will come and take your bodies. And he took his followers to this remote place. They committed suicide and waiting with their luggage for aliens to come and take them to salvation. There was a woman who made her religion. She called it the hugging religion. She came to Australia and everybody said, yeah, hug, hug, hug. Why? Because it's false. Why not? Follow something that's false and can be manipulated and edited as we please. But when it comes to the truth, which you can't change, uh, they say we are imprisoned with it. With it. It's, it, 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 it restricts us. No, you are against the truth. You don't want to accept honesty. You don't want to accept trustworthiness. You don't want to accept all these values because they restrict you from doing the wrong thing. That's the truth. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Ibrahim السلام, came to them and he was the son of, his father was nicknamed Azar. And Azar is a kind name. Ibrahim السلام's father had good values and that is that he was kind to the people. He was so kind that he used to himself manufacture the idols for them in different shapes made to order. <laughs> Gods made to order. And they used to buy them off their father, of his father Azza. They trusted him and they, each person would get a God of their own, call it a name and make it the God of something as their feelings desire. The God of trust, the God of uh, marriage, the God of this or the God of that. Like Greek theology. And people used to pray to them, look at them, talk to them, give them offerings and everything else. As you know, idolatry. Ibrahim السلام, grew up and one day he was approximately what you would call today 12 years old. And he realized in his instinctive conscious nature. Instinctive conscious what? Nature. Instinctive con 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 conscious nature is what we call in Arabic in the hadith, what the Prophet taught us, it is al-fitrah. Fit 
Fitrah. Fitrah, every person is born with it to naturally, without any manipulation, without any influence from society or parents or people around you. This is the secret within every human being and intuition that makes you question, where did I come from? There has to be a creator. There has to be a being that made all of this. And, it's, got, and it's, it's supported by our eyes and our ears and our brain and our hearts. All of these support us to guide us. Subhanallah. When Ibrahim salam noticed this, he immediately, like any other child, if a child looks at you praying to a stone, and you say to the stone, give me, give me, the child will say, huh? He's not talking to you. Why are you talking to a rock? You don't even have to teach the child that. My children say this to me all the time. I, I've developed this habit, brothers and sisters. Wallahi, I'm not insane or crazy. Trust me. It's just that when you're a public speaker, they all tell you, you talk to yourself a lot. I've been driving. I, I don't realize I was talking to myself. Trained. I don't know why that happens. My kids... Always recognize me. Dad's. Dad, why are you talking to yourself again? It's like, obviously, you don't talk to yourself. That's great, it's true. Kids, that's what they're saying, basically. That's instinct of a child. Once I said, uh, she said to me, I want to see Allah. Can't see. Why? That's instinctive. Why? The fact that she says, I want to see Allah, means that instinctively we want to connect with the higher power. <laughs> she said, I can't see him. Why? I said, Because not right now, but in Jannah you can. She says, Why? She says, Right now it's hard to see him because your eyes will burn. Can you look at the sun? She says, No, you can't look at the sun. She says, Okay. Well, how can I see Allah? Can I get a ladder? No, a ladder won't reach. She said, okay, well, I'm going to talk to him. I said, you can talk to him in Salat. She goes, I want to hug him. I said, in Salat. And she goes, oh, is that why we do this? <laughs> We're hugging him. For a child, what are you going to say? I said, yes. <laughs> yes. And that encouraged her to pray. Another time, she said, she did something wrong to me. And I showed her a bit of anger. She got scared. Started to cry. And she, instead of running away from me, she wanted to hug me. No, no, go away. I push her, she's pushing forward. But if you're scared of someone, aren't you meant to run away? Yes? She's running to me. That day I thought, why would my daughter run to me when she's supposed to be scared of me? The harder I pushed, the more she pushed to come. She's afraid, but her fear is guiding her to come closer to me. Because she knows her father has mercy and love, because he's her dad. Her father's meant to be the safety. Right at that point, she felt that she lost that side of her dad. She wants the love back. She didn't lose her dad. She lost that side of her dad. She wants it back. So she's pushing to make me love her again. And the way to do this is to hug her. I put her in my lap finally. Hugged her. She slept. She felt safe. Wallahi, she taught me a stronger, deeper meaning to the word ittaqullah. The taqwa of Allah. To fear Allah. What do you mean to fear Allah? That He'll destroy me? No. No. To fear Allah means to run away. To run away from being distant from Allah. To Allah. Run away from Allah. To Allah. Run away. From disconnecting from Allah to establishing the love of Allah. 
Run away to Allah to feel safe. Run away from all this stuff that's around you to Allah. Your safety is only with Him. Fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means to stay away from the things that make you distant from Him. That's what we're afraid of. And running to Him to get that safety, security, love back. For oh Wallahi, as Allah says in the Quran, Behold, it is in the remembrance of Allah that the hearts feel safe. My brothers and sisters, Ibrahim was like that, alayhi salam. At a tender age, he sees his father praying to these idols and selling them. He sees everybody carrying them on their shoulder, on their camels, putting them in places and praying to them. Why? Umar al-Khattab says, In my Jahiliya days, I used to, when I used to travel, I used to make my God, because he had a big statue God, because I can't carry him, it's too heavy. So I used to get dates, because dates are like clay. I'd, I'd mold them into something that looks like my statue at home. I'd carry it with me on my journey. Whenever I needed something, I'd pray to it. He goes, Umar al-Khattab used to eat a lot before it's snap. So he goes, when I reached halfway and I ran out of food, I got too hungry. So I started to eat my God. <laughs> Ibrahim comes to his father and says, Ya Abati. Now the word Abati in Arabic is like saying, My dear beloved father. It is the ultimate way of combining between showing your love to him and your respect. Both. So when you say Abi, it's a respect. Abati, respect and closeness. So both of them. His father's a Kafir. Ibrahim is a Mu'min. Yet he is addressing his father with the most tender and respectful address. Ya Abati. This tells us that even if your parents are disbelievers and they fight you in order to leave your deen, don't obey them in that, but still address them with respect, tenderness, and love. وَإِنْ جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَلَّا تُشْرِكَ بِي Allah says, and if your parents struggle and strive in every way to not believe in me, فَلَا تُطَعْهُمَا Don't obey them. وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا But continue to accompany them in life with goodness. My brothers and sisters, he says, يَا أَبَتِي لِمَا تَعْبُدُ مَا لَا يَسْمَعُ وَلَا يُسْكِرُ وَلَا يُغْنِ عَنْكَ شَيْئًا Oh Dad, I want to know, why do you worship something that doesn't hear, doesn't see, and doesn't benefit you in anything? That's a child's words. Why are you talking to yourself, Dad? Why are you worshiping something that doesn't hear or listen? Child, instinctive, fitra. يَا أَبَتِي he addresses him again. Ya Abati, dear beloved father, I love you. La ta'budi shaitan. He keeps going. Uh, don't worship the shaitan. Shaitan is evil. Inna shaitan kan al-Ibrahmani asliya. The shaitan always disobeys the most merciful. You see, his father knew about the story of Adam. He knew about the story of shaitan. He knows the story about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They all worshipped Allah one and only, but they made partners with him. Just like Muhammad وسلم, when Allah addresses him, he used to say to him, tell them not to make partners with Allah. And they used to reply to him by saying, we do worship Allah alone. But we, we also worship these idols because they bring us closer to him. Through, we need intercessors, which is shirk. Allah does not need an intercessor. Allah says, If my worshippers ask you about me, I am close, I'm always close, you don't need. And that's why the messengers died. So that we don't think that we need messengers to reach Allah. Messengers bring us the message to teach us and guide us. Then Allah takes them away so we can focus on Allah. As Abu Bakr Siddiq عنه, said when the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, died and the whole of the city was crying, an earthquake of cries. Some people wanted to leave Islam, some people wanted to die. Abu Bakr stood up and said, Man kana Allah fa inna Allah hayyun la yamut. Whoever used to worship Allah, he is ever living and he will never die. Woman kana ya'budu Muhammadan fa inna Muhammadan qad mat. And whoever used to worship Muhammad, وسلم, then he has died. So we worship Allah alone. And he said to him, 
Ya Abati, O oh my beloved father, there has come to me news that has not come to you yet. Fattabi'ni, follow me. Ahdika Sirat al Sawiya. I can I am able to guide you to a, 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 a guidance which suits both of us that you taught me on, and I will revert revert it with regurgitate to you. So his father knew the truth, and his father knew that these idols weren't going to benefit him. After a little while, the father sort of got convinced by his son. So he says, all right then, you know, you take them and sell them in the market. At least benefit some money with them. So Ibrahim Aleyhisselam goes out with the idols to the market and he says, Oh people, oh people, who would like to buy something, a product that cannot benefit you in any way and cannot harm you in any way? <laughs> Who's going to buy a product that can't benefit anyone and can't harm anyone? I mean, a gun can harm people, right? Or bite to harm people, stop people. And a, uh, you know, a perfume benefits you, right? Food benefits you. He goes, it does a benefit and cannot harm. Can't do anything with it. But buy it. Come on, I'll give you a special price. Nobody bought the idols because they didn't see them. They didn't know what he was talking about. When he returned back home and found that he couldn't sell anything, the father said, well, could you say something that doesn't benefit or harm? He goes, Dad, I'm telling the truth. Ibrahim salam was one of those who wore his heart on his sleeves. He spoke how he felt, not how he felt, what he believed. So Ibrahim salam comes back and this is what happened. And then one day he says to his father something not good. As he grew up older, his father says to him, the king Namrud is our God. And he said, no, he's not. Allah is the God of Namrud and you. In the Israelite tradition, it said that his father slapped his son and his mother slapped his son because there was abuse. They started to abuse Ibrahim himself. This is called religious abuse. And they said that how dare you leave the religion of your own parents? Emotional abuse. And then physical abuse. And they tried to play with his mind. Psychological abuse. All forms of abuse Ibrahim went through with his parents. And finally, his father said to him, Are you, do you think that you are greater than me and our belief that you think you're better? than my own gods, Ya Ibrahim. If you don't stop what you're doing, I will stone you. And abandon. Get out of here. I will abandon you. I will disown you. Ibrahim السلام, continued to tenderly talk to his father, regardless. Until finally, Ibrahim made the choice and there was no hope. And he said to his father, if you're not going to accept me, you're not going to have me, I will leave you alone. I will continue to ask Allah to forgive you. And I will continue to call upon Allah. My Lord will never leave me alone and I hope that he guides you and me, my father. So even when he left, he still made dua for his father. He still made istighfar for his father and for his mother. But he had to leave because his father would no longer allow him to stay. As he left, he went, first of all, to the church. The, the church, not a Christian church, it was their place of worship and they had all the idols there. And he looked up at the stars and he said to the people, I feel sick. And I need to stay here so the idols can cure me. And this shows us that the people of Babylonia used to have this belief about the way the stars were positioned. They had belief in, uh, in uh, uh, astrology. And they said, yeah, that's good, that's fine. You can stay here, you can worship the idols and get God, you know, whatever, these stars or whatever to cure you. They left him. And he had in his little baggage an axe. Uh, not an axe, a, a, a sledgehammer. When they left, he looked at the idols and he spoke to the idols. He says, have some food. No one spoke to him. Came to the big one. It was a big statue. Take some food, eat. The 
didn't talk to him. And Ibrahim said, ما لكم لا تطلقون? What's wrong with you that you can't talk? Now no one's around him. <laughs> but as I said, this teaches us and tells about his personality. Ibrahim was so for the truth to the point where even when he's by himself, he's acting out their faults just to prove to himself a point as well. Why don't you talk back? <laughs> and he said, Wallah, well, I know that you have no power whatsoever and you are just stones that they have built. He grabs the sledgehammer and starts to break the idols. And he leaves the big idol as it is. He goes and hangs the sledgehammer on its neck and he leaves the, he leaves the, uh, the, the place of worship. The next day, the people come along and they see their idols all smashed. And they call, they were enraged. Who did this to our gods? Who did this to our gods? Who broke our gods? So they have to protect their gods. I mean, they're, they're basically proving the argument against themselves. A god's meant to protect you. You're praying to it to protect you. But instead, now you've got to protect it and stand up for it. Obviously, they knew it was false. So one of them said, it was a young boy, you call Ibrahim. He's the one who did it. They said, Harriquhu, Lobby. Burn him, burn him. Wansuru Ali Hataku. And save your gods. <laughs> I mean that what they mean, save the ideology that you believe in. The false ideology. So Ibrahim was caught. Now, in our Sharia, you shouldn't really go into people's places and break their idols and their crosses and all of that stuff. But with Ibrahim there was no Sharia like that, and he hadn't yet become a prophet. And he was part of the people, and he was one of them. He broke his basically his own people's belief. And when they brought him, the story is, you know, he said, بَلْ فَعَلَهُ كَبِيرُهُمْ هَذَا فَاسْأَلُهُ إِنْ كَانُوا يَلْتِقُونَ Oh no, it's the big one there, that big statue. He's the one that broke all the other idols. He got jealous of them and he wanted to prove that he's the bigger God. Now obviously he's teaching them something. He's saying, number one, if you have too many gods, they're going to start fighting. Because each one's going to fight for their kingdom. Is that correct? I mean, your own king, Namrud, calls himself a god. He wants godliness to himself. And Allah does say in the Quran, إِنْ كَانَ فِيهِمَا آلِهَةٌ غَيْرُ اللَّهِ لَخْتَلَفْ If there were more than one god in this universe, then they would, this universe would be corrupted. And each God will fight the other God to be the main God. They started thinking, that's true. He just wants to be the main God because the biggest and most powerful, he killed all the others. So they looked at Ibrahim and he said, <laughs> Ibrahim, look, this is coming. You know and we know that they can't talk. All right, no, just, just not why we're doing it, man. We're trying to survive here, you know. We're trying to get some money in. We're trying to help big people and small people, you know, the hierarchy. Work with us, man. We'll give you some stuff. So the truth be, he's told. It must sound And uh, they knew he's lying, otherwise he wouldn't lie. Like he was, he was, he was lying, but the lie was a type that everybody knew. So you're allowed to say something when you know everybody knows that you are lying, right? You know that's not. It's no longer, it's a lie, but it's not a harmful lie, right? It's not a white lie, it's still a lie. But people know that you're just, it's like when you joke and you say, look, I'm lying. It's just, and everybody says, yeah, we know, we know, we know. We're just trying to get the moral of the story. So they were almost about to sort of follow him, and then he said something. He said, <laughs> Two, two on you and your gods. Uffin means two. It's like spitting at someone. He shouldn't have done that. But he had the right to do that. Because they were offering him. They were bribing him. They were trying to say, hey, join us. Become corrupt like us. And he abhorred that to the point where he says, to, to you and what you are calling, you're bribing me now? You want me to share your corruption? You want me to share your injustice of the people? And you've been using these gods to put these people down and to use them and to exploit them? Fill upon you and the gods that you worship, meaning and this ideology that you fabricated in order to corrupt the people and become oppressive. At that point, they didn't like it. They were about to be exposed, you see. So the leader said, 
burn him, burn him, burn him. And so everybody said, yeah, burn him, burn him. They grabbed Ibrahim and said, he can't talk anymore. They tied him up with ropes and they put him in the catapult. And they said, bring all the trees and all the wood and everything. They kept gathering it until it was the height of three story, a three-story building in the hadith. They lit it up. The fire was so huge that people had to stand really back. They couldn't throw him in there except for the catapult. They put him in the catapult. They wouldn't hear from him anymore. And they released it. Ibrahim السلام, starts flying in the air, heading towards the big blazing fire. In the hadith, which is, uh, I'm not sure if it's sahih, but Allah alam, it's weak, but the moral of the story is that the angel Israfil came to him and he said to him, ask me for anything I'll give you. And Ibrahim said, I have someone who's already looking after me. And then Mikail came, he said, I am, Allah has given me the power of controlling the climate. Ask me, I will extinguish the fire. He said, I already have someone who's protecting me. And then he said his following word. Now this is the authentic one. Qal, hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Enough is Allah for me. Wa ni'mal wakil. And he is the best to rely on. Like, what, why are you guys coming to me? You, 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 you. Allah is the best. And he is enough for me. This, my brothers and sisters, is the ultimate lesson here. He is about to be thrown into a blazing fire, no doubt. And he has no power whatsoever. The angels have come to him and he can see him. And yet, he says, my belief in Allah is enough and so strong that he is the only one that can save me. Now, brothers and sisters, don't misunderstand this way. You just sit there at your home and you say, God will save us, God will save us. And you don't do anything. Ibrahim can't, couldn't do anything at all. Yet still, at that point, he did something. What is it? He called upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's all he could do. If he could have done anything else, he would have done it. And rely on Allah at the same time. Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil is a statement that Ibrahim said when he was thrown in the fire. No believer in the world who is distressed and full of hardship to a point where they've hit rock bottom and they have none but Allah except they say, Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take them out of any hardship that they are in. Abad. You have to mean it from your heart. Allah says in the Quran, وَقُلْنَا يَا نَارُ كُونِي بَرْدًا وَسَلَامًا عَلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمٌ We said to the fire, O oh fire, be cool and peaceful on Ibrahim. If he had said be cool, the fire would have frozen him to death. But he said be cool and peaceful. Only the ropes got burnt off him and Ibrahim السلام, went into the fire. Ibrahim السلام, stayed in the fire for days until the fire was extinguished. And on a, after a few days, they all saw Ibrahim walk out of the fire before their eyes. And only one person believed in him. SubhanAllah. His name was Lut, a cousin of Ibrahim. Ibrahim said, there was never a better day than the day that I was in the fire. For nobody abused me. And Allah gave him a fountain. And he said, I was praying, eating and drinking. My brothers and sisters in Islam, I'll stop here now. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of it. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite us in goodness, happiness, and iman in this world and the next. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa alayhi.